So what are matrices? Why would you ever want to know about them? It turns out that matrices are absolutely fundamental. What are their applications? Well, this is what Wikipedia says about matrices. Applications of matrices are found in most scientific fields, in every branch of physics. Every branch of physics. And then it goes on giving examples and even outside physics. The study of matrices is a huge topic and we could spend the entire year studying them if we wanted. So what are they? I can explain matrices starting from their formal definition. A matrix is a rectangular array of numbers arranged into m rows and n columns. I could then give you recipes on how to add them, multiply them, invert them, and several other things. However, this approach seems artificial to me. Where do all the rules come from? Instead, I'm going to choose a different approach, in which all the rules can be explained from first principles. My approach will be to introduce matrices from the point of view of their main application in physics, which is to represent a linear transformation of vectors. A matrix, let's call it A, represents a linear transformation of vectors. An input vector X is converted into an output vector Y. This transformation of a vector into another can be represented using a matrix multiplication, such that vector Y equals matrix A times vector X. This is a lot of new information for you to digest. There are lots of important concepts in this single slide. Before we even start looking at how this multiplication of a matrix with a vector works, we first need to understand what a linear transformation of vectors actually is. So I'm going to spend the next five minutes or so explaining this very carefully. To do this, I'm going to break up the label into its constituent words explaining them one by one. First, what is a transformation? A transformation is something that gets an input and transforms it to produce an output. Transformations are also called operators or functions. You have extensively studied the case of functions f, which take an input x and produce an output y. A transformation like this is set to map points in the input real number line into new points of the output real number line. We usually represent this with a graph, by putting the real number line as the x and y axis and drawing their correspondence. But those functions are just the tip of the iceberg. What if instead of having a single number in and a single number out, we have n numbers in and m numbers out? Then we can collect the inputs and outputs into different vectors. This is therefore a transformation of vectors. A vector comes in and a vector pops out. Now instead of mapping a real line to a real line, this transformation of vectors maps an n-dimensional vector space, where the input vectors x are living, into an m-dimensional vector space, where the output vectors y are living. As we know, vector spaces can represent lots of different things. We could be mapping video game characters into colors, for example. And what about the word linear? The truth is that studying all possible transformations of vectors in the most general case would be too much for us now. The possibilities are endless. Instead, we are going to focus only on linear transformations. Linear transformations are a tiny subset of all the possible transformations. What does linear transformation mean? Consider a transformation that we denote as A, acting on vectors and producing vectors. This is how to tell if this transformation is linear. First, get any two input vectors, u and v, and let's say that the outputs are A and B, respectively. Now we do the following checks. We try the addition u plus v as inputs, and the output turns out to be an addition of the individual outputs, 
This means that the transformation is linear with addition. We then try scaling one of the inputs, and we see that the transformation is linear with scaling. We can combine both tests into a single one, like this. In words, a linear combination of inputs results in the same linear combination with the same coefficients, but acting on the corresponding outputs. If this is true for every possible choice of vectors u and v, and for any possible linear coefficients lambda and mu, then the transformation is linear. Let's see how this works. Let's apply this test to the one-dimensional case that you are familiar with, y equals f of x. Which functions y equals f of x are linear? Let's start with a simple example, the function y equals x squared. This function is not linear because 1 goes to 1, but 2, which is 1 plus 1, goes to 4, which is not the sum of the outputs. So clearly there is no linearity in scaling and no linearity in addition. In fact, most functions that you have studied are not linear. e to the x, sine of x, etc. They are all non-linear functions. The only functions that exist which are linear functions are those that can be written as y equals a times x, where a is a scalar. This corresponds to a simple multiplication, and in usual graph representation it is a line crossing the origin. This is ridiculously simple in the one-dimensional case. But even this really simple case of multiplication becomes complex and beautiful when we extend it to vector transformations of more dimensions. How does that work? A linear transformation in higher number of dimensions becomes a matrix multiplication. The scalar A, which acted as the multiplier of the input, now becomes a matrix. So, a matrix multiplies itself times a vector and produces a new vector. As I will show later, it does so in a linear way. So think about it like this. Learning about matrices is similar to the first time you learned about multiplication. But now we are doing it to numbers of more dimensions. We are doing it with vectors. That's how fundamental matrices are. No wonder they are used everywhere. And never forget that the good old multiplication y equals a times x is in fact a particular example of a matrix operation in the special easy case that the input and output vectors are one-dimensional. The scalar A can be seen as a matrix with one row and one column. This means that any general property which applies to all matrices of any number of dimensions will of course apply to the specific one-dimensional case, the good old multiplication. So for example, we will learn the concept of matrix multiplication and matrix inverse, which becomes the usual scalar multiplication and scalar division in the one-dimensional case. Of course, this does not work the other way around. Not all properties of simple multiplication in the one-dimensional case necessarily extend to the more general case of matrices with more dimensions. For the sake of completeness of this Venn diagram, Remember that linear transformations are just a tiny subset of all possible transformations of vectors. It's only the linear transformations that can be written using matrix multiplication. In the same way that you cannot write a nonlinear function such as y equals x squared or y equals sine x using a simple multiplication of scalars, you also cannot write nonlinear transformations of vectors using a matrix multiplication. Matrices work only for linear transformations. This is very important. The study of these linear transformations is the main focus of linear algebra, one of the big branches of mathematics. So now we understand what linear transformation of vectors means, and we will now focus on understanding how matrix multiplication works. For this, I'm going to take a long path and derive it from first principles. I will start from the properties of linear transformations of vectors. First, let's get a feel for how linear transformations look like and how they behave. Remember, when we considered one-dimensional vectors, scalars, a linear transformation could be visualized and understood as a simple line graph. 
With this graph, you instantaneously know all about the transformation. In fact, you can see all possible inputs and how they map into their outputs. But what happens with linear transformations acting on vectors of higher dimensions? Is there a nice way of visualizing it? Unfortunately, in general, we cannot visualize a linear transformation of vectors in a single figure. There's just too many outputs and too many inputs. We can only do it, and with some difficulty, in some very simple cases. For example, a transformation of a 2D vector into another 2D vector is easy. You can easily draw the input two-dimensional vector and then show how this input vector is transformed by the linear transformation A, resulting in the corresponding output two-dimensional vector, A of V. We can now change the input vector and see how the output changes. Unfortunately, we are only seeing the effect of this transformation of one particular input vector at a time. So we are not seeing all of the information about the transformation at once. Can we see how all input vectors are transformed all at once? One thing we can do is to draw lots of vectors as our inputs and then see how each of them is transformed. Or we can reduce the clutter by plotting only the endpoints of the vectors using dots. Notice something interesting. The points started as a nice uniform lattice, and they ended up as another uniform lattice. It turns out that this is always true for linear transformations. In fact, any set of vectors whose endpoints form any line in the input vector space, they are all transformed into another set of vectors whose endpoints also form a line in the output vector space. Straight lines always map into straight lines after a linear transformation. In fact, we can generalize this. We can say that any vector subspace in the input vector space, for example a line or a plane in 3D, is always mapped into another subspace in the output vector space with equal or smaller number of dimensions. We can prove this analytically from the linearity property. If we have a set of vectors lying in a line, x equals r0 plus lambda b, and we now apply a linear transformation a to them, then the set of output vectors are as follows. And thanks to the linearity of the transformation, we can write we see that the set of vectors y also forms a line. Also, any two parallel lines in the input space will remain parallel after a linear transformation. This can be proven by considering lines with different values of r0, but same values of v in the above expression. This gives us an even better way to plot transformations of two-dimensional or even three-dimensional vectors we can just plot the uniform rectangular grid of parallel lines separated by a distance of 1 on the input space and show how this grid transforms into a new grid which will also be made up of uniformly spaced parallel lines. This is always true for any linear transformation. We will use this visualization very often. Therefore, different linear transformations in two dimensions can be represented by different transformations of this grid. Notice how in every possible linear transformation, the origin stays always put. It doesn't move. And what about dimensions higher than 3? We cannot visualize those. What can we do instead? How can we describe a transformation mathematically? For the general case of any arbitrary transformation, the transformation could really be anything. So you would have to find a way of specifying what each possible input vector maps into. You would in principle need an infinite and countable list of how each input vector maps into its corresponding output vector. This is clearly a rather silly approach. But it turns out that for linear transformations, we can write a complete description of the transformation saying much, much less. This is how we do it. Imagine any input vector being fed into a linear transformation A. 
This input vector can be written, as always, as a unique linear combination of the basis vectors. And since the transformation is linear, we can apply the linearity property to the output. Therefore, we apply the transformation separately to each basis vector and do the corresponding linear combination. So think hard about this. This is key. If we know how the operation affects each of the basis vectors of the input space, then that's it. We have completely defined the linear operator acting on any input vector. Once we know the transformed unit vectors, AE1, AE2, and so on, for every basis vector in the input vector space, then we can know what happens to any vector input in general by simply doing a linear combination of the transformed unit vectors. The coefficients of the linear combination must be the same as those of the input vector with the basis vectors. That is, exactly the components of the input vector. Therefore, to fully describe the transformation, we can provide a finite list, or table, describing how each of the basis vectors of the input space is mapped into the output space. And this is enough to completely describe a linear transformation. There's just nothing else to say about it. This information is everything there is to know. That was a very general argument which might have sounded a bit abstract. But as I'm about to show you, it's directly related to the transformation of the grid that we saw earlier in two dimensions. You could say that the initial rectangular grid is fully defined by the unit vectors in the input vector space. In this case, the unit vectors x hat and y hat. And what happens with these unit vectors if we apply the transformation to them? They end up being, respectively, the vectors a of x hat and a of y hat. And these two new vectors are exactly what defines the new grid in the transformed space. And remember what we said. Any vector v, which is a linear combination of x hat and y hat, ends up being a vector a of v, which is the same linear combination, but acting on the vectors a x hat and a y hat. In other words, think about this visually. Now simply draw the original path of the input vector in the original grid formed by the basis vectors. The path was two squares to the right and two squares up. To find the transformed vector a of v, follow the same path, but instead of moving along the original grid, move along the new transformed grid. So two squares in this direction and two squares in this other direction. These new directions are not x hat and y hat. Instead, they are the transformed version of the basis vectors. So we are adding 2 times a x hat plus 2 times a y hat. This visual trick works for any vector. For example, consider the vector v equals 3, 2 as the input. The output is then a of v. In the input space grid, to locate v, we move 3 to the right and 2 up. And to locate the output vector a of v, we also move 3 squares in this new right direction and 2 squares in this new up direction. This trick of moving along the transformed grid works for any input vector. Let's write all of this analytically. As we said, to describe a linear transformation, we just have to provide a list of where each basis vector ends up. This list defines our transformed grid. Then, for a specific vector v, which is a linear combination of x hat and y hat, the transformed output is the same linear combination of these two transformed basis vectors. And this can be done for any input vector, vx and vy. So that's it. The linear transformation is fully and completely defined by giving this list of rules. In the 2D case, we simply give a list of two vectors, telling us where each of the original basis vectors x hat y hat is transformed into. So we now know how to describe linear transformations in general. At the end of the day, 
we describe a linear transformation completely by using nothing more and nothing less than a straightforward list of vectors. Let's see how this is related to matrices. At the beginning of the lecture, we said that linear transformations of vectors can be seen as a matrix multiplication. So let me go ahead and write this exact same operation that we have on the top here using the matrix convention on the bottom here. We just have to write the list of vectors that define the transformation as being the columns on a grid of numbers which we call a matrix. Why the columns and not the rows? Actually, it's an arbitrary convention that everyone follows and it determines how matrix multiplication works. This matrix then represents the linear transformation completely. In this simple two-dimensional case, the first column tells us where x hat lands and the second column tells us where y hat lands. We can use the letter A for the matrix, the same letter that we used for the transformation. When typewriting, many books use bold notation for matrices, exactly like vectors, and we usually use capital letters for matrices and lowercase letters for vectors. So let's follow with this example. What is the result of this matrix multiplication? To denote matrix multiplication, we write the output as a multiplication of matrix A times vector V by writing them one next to the other like in the usual scalar multiplication. But this matrix multiplication should be exactly equivalent to the linear transformation above, so the outputs must be the same. Let's copy it here. This shows us how matrix multiplication is done. In summary, we use each component of the input vector as a coefficient for each column of the matrix. This matrix multiplication completely represents the given linear transformation. This is the basic essence of what a matrix really is. And this is its main application in physics. It's really, really important that you really understand the contents of this whole slide and understand why everything works. Ultimately, it all comes down to the linearity of the transformation. Once you understand it in this simple example of a transformation between two-dimensional vectors, let's move on to the general case. Consider a linear transformation which converts an n-dimensional vector space, with basis vectors e1, e2, etc., into an m-dimensional vector space, with basis vectors b1, b2, etc. The linear operation maps each of the basis vectors of the input space to a given vector in the output space. For example, E1 is mapped into this column vector, with elements A11, H1, up to AM1. These elements are a vector written in the basis of the output space. Then, basis vector E2 is mapped to a different vector, and so on with all the basis vectors of the input space. In total, we need to know n different vectors, corresponding to where each of the basis vectors lands in the output space. These vectors are the fingerprint which defines the transformation. With this knowledge, as we saw earlier, we can write the output vector for any arbitrary input vector, all thanks to the linearity of the transformation. Now, this same linear transformation can be written in the form of a matrix. As we said, we simply collect each of the fingerprints of our transformation into the columns of a grid. So the grid has n columns, and each column is the m-dimensional output vector corresponding to the transformation of each of the basis vectors in the input space. Therefore, the matrix has m rows and n columns, and it is said to be an m by n matrix. Always by convention, we state the number of rows first and the number of columns second. Similarly, we also denote the elements of the matrix using two subscripts the row first and the column second. The output is then written as y equals a times x, and it is equal to the output of the linear transformation, so we can copy it from above, which gives us, from a simple logical argument, the general recipe for multiplying a matrix times a vector. 
If you want, you can write the output vector explicitly by performing the sum of vectors. As usual, we always prefer to use the summation notation, which saves us a lot of space. Matrix multiplication can be written in a single line like this. Make sure you understand the use of the two subscripts here. Again, I point out that when referring to elements of a matrix or to the size of a matrix, we always say the rows first and the columns second. So this is the recipe for matrix vector multiplication. I could have just given you this recipe at the start of the lecture, but it might have looked a little bit like black magic. Hopefully now you know what this multiplication really represents. Matrices simply represent a linear transformation. Just imagine the transformed grid associated with the transformed unit vectors and put those transformed unit vectors as the columns of the matrix. Remember, once again, the output of each unit vector of the input space is written as the columns of the matrix. If you digest this idea, linear algebra becomes very easy. I'd like to clarify that the derivation I made here was long-winded. Matrix multiplication can be defined in a more direct but less intuitive way. If an output vector depends linearly on an input vector, then each of the elements of the output vector y must each be a linear combination of all the elements of the input vector x. Thus, we get m equations with n coefficients each, forming the m times n set of numbers which become the elements of a matrix. To end this lecture, I'm going to show you a neat little trick that I always use to actually remember how to multiply matrices with vectors. For instance, in the product a times x, I first copy a here, and then I copy x to the right of a but shift it upwards, here. This leaves a convenient space in the corner here, with the shape of a vector, and here is where I write the result. Each element of the result is found by doing the dot product of the corresponding row and column, which visually point towards the element. So we multiply the first element times the first element, plus the second times the second, etc. This gives us exactly the correct answer for the output element. This procedure can be repeated for every slot in the output vector. Also, this immediately gives us a way to check if the dimensions of the matrix are wrong. In order for a matrix vector multiplication to be a valid operation, the number of dimensions of the vector must be equal to the number of columns of the matrix. After all, remember that each column represents the output of each of the basis vectors of the input vector. Also, this trick immediately gives us the size of the output vector, which must be equal to the number of rows of the matrix. The really great thing about this trick is that it can be extended for the more confusing case of multiplication of a matrix with another matrix, which we will soon study. The method works exactly the same in that case. So there you go. This was the introductory lecture to matrices. Any time that we want to transform a vector into another, in a linear way, we use a matrix. This is done all the time in physics. For example, the electric field is a vector which gets modified when we transmit it through an optical element, and so the optical element can be regarded as a matrix. This is just one example, but remember, matrices are useful in every branch of physics.